go. Streaming from South Africa to the world. To the world. This is the Stonks Go Moon podcast. What just happened? We break it down so you don't have to. Welcome everyone to the Stones Go Moon podcast. My guest today, Nemanja Zivkovic. He is the CEO and founder of Funky Marketing. Also has a brilliant podcast called the Funky Marketing Show. Welcome to the pod. Hey, my man. Glad to be here. Let's, oh. uh, let's, uh, let's chat about some good things. Let's chat about... Well, let's, let's get serious for a moment before we get into the, the good things. You are LinkedIn royalty, yeah? How many followers now? Uh, I don't think that I am because now, now I have. Uh, I was just chatting with Zineb Layachi the other day. Yeah, and yeah. Complimenting her like, ah, oh, you now you now have twenty three thousand followers, <laughs> and she was like, don't you have more? Like I used to have because I remove people when I see that they are not a fit. And she was like, man, you need to do it again because uh, look, I had. 23 yes. I don't know like six months ago, okay. yes something like that now I'm 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 back at it again but I removed like people from Balkan region okay because there were none of them that were talking some things that I was interested in and okay. they were not my target audience yeah but now they they just added me all of them again and that, they started <laughs> talking some some things that Makes sense. So I say, okay, let it go. Let, let it go back in. But I mean, that's how you know that you're LinkedIn royalty when you can afford to remove people. Like um, that's how you know that you're royalty. Listen, no, look, look when yeah? I when I when I started funky marketing, I had nine thousand, and uh-huh. I removed three thousand three thousand people because I was looking to find out because, like, when I started, it was all uh, in English, uh-huh. LinkedIn and everything, but when I because I was working for a Canadian agency and then I moved to work for an agency based in Serbia yes. and I needed to talk some things in Serbian. So basically I needed to learn how to pronounce some things in marketing in Serbian. Mm-hmm. And I was started talking in Serbian. As soon as I posted first post in Serbian, I could only see people from Serbia in my feed. And I was trying to find a way to, to get back to the English feed. Oh. So, uh, changing the uh, the location, all kind of different stuff. And I removed the people to see if that's going to work. But uh, basically, I just needed to add more people who are not from Serbia and talking in English. So that's I, really, I, I, yeah. No, that's really I, interesting. I, that's very interesting because what you're touching on, it's completely off topic and where I want to go. But it's about reprogramming the algorithm or a algorithm, right? And it's very hard to do once you built an account on a set uh, on a set path and you sort of added people and showed it what it likes and mm-hmm. and what you, what do you like it's you're almost better off starting a new account um than trying to rejig an an algorithm well that's my perception yeah uh look like new accounts are now getting the huge traction at mm-hmm. least from the start so from that perspective as well but uh you know basically i just deleted three and something thousand people just to to test it out and it was not worth it but yeah hey okay what i can do i, I tested it and i'm yeah. now back back on the track so but that's what we do we we try and test does it work trial rapid fire trial and error right let's get into the pod um first of all i want to ask you um is it true that only 5% of uh, B2B uh, buyers are actually looking to buy in this current climate? Because that's a statistic that's been thrown around. I've seen it a couple of places, but there's I, I haven't actually seen empirical data. Yeah, actually, it's, it's uh, data from the LinkedIn B2B Marketing Institute. Uh, okay. And uh, I don't know who has done the research for them, but it's published on their on their website. There are a couple of others, uh, huge researches uh, and ebooks over there that I recommend to people go and check them out. Okay. Uh, but but I think it's less than five percent. This Ooh. is maybe two two percent. Wow. Uh, and why is that? It's because um, man in B two B. 
first of all, lots of companies are already working and already have tools is that they have uh, a huge uh, amount of people that are in, included in the decision-making process. So let's okay. say it's, uh, I don't know, marketing ops tool. Marketing yes. needs to be involved. Then the, the CMO needs to be involved. Then the CFO needs to be involved to, to get the money. If they are smaller, then it's the founder as well. Uh, so it's a lot of eyeballs on one thing. So mm -hmm. the decision needs to be, uh, it takes time for the decision to be made. Okay. Uh, and also like usually in B2B things, tools, services are not uh, cheap. Yes. So when you are investing in something that will uh, give you return, not right now, but maybe in a couple of years, then you are thinking twice uh, or even more about what you should do. All mm -hmm. those things are actually not something that you can control. Okay. So which, uh, bring, which brings me to my mm -hmm. sort of my, my segue into that. It's that, so if, if you're saying it's less than 5%, right? So it means that your marketing strategy needs to change because you can't keep on doing the same thing because you're just going to get diminished returns. And you wrote a beautiful piece on this. Um, I see it as sort of the five pillars of B2B marketing right now, and you call it the five trends. And I think it would be great if we could unpack that against the backdrop of that um, figure that we just said. So I'm going to start. Yeah, you, yeah I'm going to start you off and and saying um, your first pillar was uh, mapping the customer journey experience. Yeah, exactly. Look, like I think the biggest mistake people are making uh, when it comes to the B two B is not knowing who their target customers are. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say target customers, I really mean the target audience. Because uh, they look at it, uh -huh, this is the account, so this is the company. And they don't go too deep and see, uh -huh, okay, this is the CMO. This mm. is the guy uh, that is actually pursuing to buy something, for example. Mm -hmm. There's a CFO, the guy who is owning the money. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's somebody who is in, mar in the marketing team that is actually going to use what we are selling. So we need to go from a couple of uh, different angles. Mm -hmm. And I like to, and if we know how the, the journey goes, so we mm -hmm. know what is happening when they're uh, not looking, mm -hmm. how they are consuming the content, yeah. where do yeah. they go yeah. to get educated, how do they communicate? That is the first thing where we need to be. So this is before we even have the intent to buy. Uh, yeah. Then sure. when they have the intent, it's, it's totally different. Because when they have the intent, they go to the to the people that are actually that they know. So somebody yes. that is related to what they want to buy. If they don't have those people, then sure they can ask in the communities. They can ask on social media. They can pick up the phone and call. I don't know three to five of their peers, maybe more experienced, the bigger companies, and ask them, "Can hey, we work with with somebody that?" Does this, or do you know any tool that we can use? Or they can ask for the specific tool if. They already have somebody, someone on top of mind. And only then they go to Google when they have the intent. I mean, they don't, didn't decide. Only then they go to Google. They compare the prices. They uh -huh. check out the, the case studies, the testimonials, uh, the reviews, uh -huh. all those kind of things. So another reason why we are uh, basically clo can close only like less than 5% of the people mm -hmm. and the less than five are at the market right now. Uh, but the thing is, a lot of companies are willing to do everything at once. Yes. So, you know, when, when we talk about stages of the buyer's journey, they are not happening like, aha, this is now this stage, then uh, this is another uh, one, then this is another one. They all go at the same time. Yeah, it's not linear. Yeah, yeah, I get you. I, 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 yeah. I, I follow. Uh, and, and that's why we, with our content, we need to make sure that we give everybody what they need at the specific uh, moment when they are in their buyer's journey so they can go to the next level. Not more than that. If we give them more than that, we yeah. will scare them away. Uh, I'm guilty sometimes of giving them too much on the discovery call. 
yeah. you know, because because I just start talking, I get excited about what we do and how we can help them. Yes, and I yes, scare yes, them yes. away sometimes, you know. So uh, basically, that's it. We need to mar- map out the buyer's journey, who okay. we are talking to, and how we are talking to them. And then after that, or you know, uh, before we actually start doing our marketing, I like to say that we need when we map the buyer's journey, we know which channels are they are using. Okay. And uh, so that's B two B marketing channel adaptation. That's the second pillar. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, ba- basically, we need to see you know how uh, they are adapting, which channels are they are using, and how does it goes. Uh, for example, to give you uh, what do I mean by adoption. Okay. So, like, if we say B two B, we assume they are on LinkedIn, right? And the things we are seeing in the feed are all related to the tech industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in B2B, there's industrial, there are some other things that are also B2B. Those people are also on LinkedIn. Uh, but what is interesting is that we cannot get them directly. Because mm. on LinkedIn, 80% of the content is created by marketing and salespeople. Ah, so yes. we need to create a different journey to get them through our peers, so sales and marketing. So mm. basically we create the content and engage or get people who are already active to engage with our content mm. so they can recommend us to the decision makers in their companies because we cannot get the decision makers because they are not active on LinkedIn. They are here, but they are not active. Mm. Interesting. One, one example. Then uh, another one may be uh, Twitter. Twitter is great to create to create a community to share thoughts all, all kind of different stuff, but it's harder to uh, to create a community over there. Yes, but yes. when you create it, it might it's much easier to go to LinkedIn there. LinkedIn mm. it's much easier to create a community. Yes, and then you know depending on the uh, on the size of the company, then might come uh, you know YouTube, then might come TikTok if you have the uh, you know if you want to attract employees, if you want to share some things you know, uh, company values, cultures, those kind of things, people are using the channels in a different way. Uh, But basically, uh, that's it. And I like to, uh, what I'm seeing is the shift is being made from email marketing to some of the channels and consuming things in Mm. the feed. It doesn't mean that email marketing is dead. It just means that we need to think of of other things uh, when it comes to when it comes to channels and the way we adopt them and the way we use them. Third pillar, marketing budget is shifting. Yeah, uh, we actually have uh, this this data that says uh, like mm-hmm. uh, that the budgets, marketing budgets are going up. But yeah. I'm interesting to see what will happen, you know, in the next months as we, uh, you know, as we are having uh, economic crisis and all yes. those things like war in Ukraine, all kind of things talking about like, I don't know, Taiwan, whatever it is. Yes. And the huge shift when it comes to people changing companies, moving, etc. So it's instability. And uh, don't know what will happen with the marketing budget, but what is true and what will uh, keep uh, appearing is that uh, marketing budget is being shifted the majority of it is being invested in the digital channels okay and basically it means that companies are slowly starting to realize that the way people buy today in b2b has changed yeah and they need to invest in different channels so it's not that we need don't need to invest in uh, in offline channels for example but we need to connect them with the digital channels Mm. For example, I don't know, like a billboard is something that will make us aware, remember something, and we go to Google and we type and we find out the website, for example. Yes. But it's or like, there, 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 yeah. there is an example that, uh, I don't know who's using it um, a little bit differently. It's Gong, I yeah. think. Big fan of have, Gong, by the way. Big they, fan. Have, they have billboards when people yeah. are coming to their job interviews. So uh, they look at the companies, they look at people from the companies on their way to the offices, to the interview. And when they come to the interview, they are fully prepared of what will happen over there. Yeah. You know. I'm, I'm interested in, 
you're talking about recession and, and things like that. I mean, the recent tech layoffs, right? It's like 10, you see 10% of workforce, 17% of workforce being laid off, yet they are increasing their marketing budget. That is, that's interesting to me. What's your take there? Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Gaetano was talking about it the other day, I think, or a couple of weeks ago. I don't know, like like few, like two months are kind of like blurry. Yeah. A lot of things are happening, but uh, he was talking about it because like they demand too much from a person to yes. hire them. Yes. Uh, then they don't give them the the salary that they need, mm. but they are uh, and they are easy to let them go. Yes. So it's kind of it doesn't make sense. Yes. I th- I think it's still around. You know, uh, companies realizing what the marketing function is. Where does it go? I think we are not even close to realizing what marketing can do for the company and what it really is. And I think it's still the shift that is still happening. You you maybe think of it, it's like with the revenue ops function coming in, a lot of companies are just uh, renaming the sales to revenue ops. And I think that is also changing. Uh, and when the revenue actually takes and start being what it should be, then the marketing will find its place and it's pretty obvious what it should be. And it, it means, you know, uh, creating the go-to market strategy, uh, showing the unfair advantage of the company, creating brand and awareness uh, mm-hmm. and, and increasing the inbound revenue that's coming to the company. Yeah, that's touching on the fourth pillar, which is, in my viewpoint, the most important. Um, It's talent marketing and employer branding, because I have a saying that goes, the people with the best people win. And we've seen this so many times. If you have the best people, you're giving your company the best chance to win just because they are so client facing most of the time. Yeah, and, and it's really hard. It's really hard to do that. It's Very. really hard to, to get the right people, especially from the start. When you are just starting, you, 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 you wanted to go with this into the smaller companies. It's extremely hard to find the right people because you, one, don't have the enough money to pay them the right way, or you don't have, uh, you cannot attract the right people if you don't spread your branding, your message, and you will communicate how are you different so you can attract them as you're attracting the first clients. And uh, it's really difficult because uh, like those that you attract that are mm. coming because they, they recognize you in your story, maybe they are not those that you need. It mm. happened to mm. me. So I'm sharing from my experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's difficult, especially now with the changes coming coming all over the marketplace. Some people are working in customer support. One day, like in three months, they are getting into demand gen. Mm. Some are working into demand gen. In a couple of months ago, uh, they are going to the CMO position. So uh, a lot of things are going on. Like I'm in my experience, I'm yes. trying to communicate with as much people as possible because mm-hmm. I don't know where they will end up in a month or two. Maybe they will become my ideal clients. Maybe right now they're just my peers. Then maybe they become my my ICP. Who knows? Like uh, things yeah. are changing. But one thing that yeah. uh, I want to emphasize is if you talk about service-based companies, uh, uh, even the product-based companies, basically it's the people that are making those products or doing the services. And for some reason, especially tech companies, are not showing those people, mm. you know, because they are too scared that, that other companies will come and, and take them away. But if you know what you're <clears> doing, <throat> if you have the right culture, values, if you can pay them uh, enough and give them yes. uh, enough like uh, challenge in their projects that they are doing, then why would they go away? I, I've I've got a, I've got something that I've noticed, right? And I'm struggling. I'm just thinking my head if I should name names. I don't think I should name names, but we it sort of would will become apparent when I when I go through it. Um, you get these tech companies, SaaS especially, with one or two brand evangelists, and you will 
they will come into a company, they will bring their following, they will bring their network, they will bring their content generation, they will bring just their personalities, these big, larger than life people, and the brand will explode across LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever it is. But there's no buy in from the company management or owners to say, to the employees around them, hey, you guys need to jump on this trend. You guys need to support these people. And that is when those people get snatched up by someone else that's saying, hey, I would I would like a piece of whatever they are doing. And then those people leave and the hype just dies. It just those people dis that sorry, that not those people, those that those companies disappear. And I'm like, it's instant. It's a week or two. And then everyone's like, damn, I, w- I wonder what happened to XYZ company. Um, I just think companies are missing a big trick there. And like you need it's, it's you can't just have two brand evangelists and think that that that's going to be enough. It, it takes a whole company or at least yeah, a, large, my, a large chunk of the company. Sorry. Yeah. In my experience, and I work with a, uh, enterprise level companies or the smaller ones, like what makes or break uh, your strategy, for example, going on LinkedIn and uh, using your people to kind of get the awareness, create the brand and get the, the new customers is, are the decision makers and the leaders involved in it? Are yeah. they leading it? Basically the single factor that makes or break breaks it. Uh, it's based on like 12 companies and it was always that thing that made uh, or uh, just broke the, the, the call strategy. Yeah, makes sense. Which brings us to our last pillar, which is content marketing has gone pro. It's, um, I'm, I'm guessing it's not enough just, just to make images on Canva and distribute it like everywhere. That's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, I was talking with, with a lot of people about this thing, like Erin Balsha is, uh, is one, of, one of those. And she mentioned one thing, like if you go to Google uh, and you check out to find really in-depth, great content, long form articles, uh, you don't find that many of them. Mm. And, and like, that's one thing that's missing looking at yeah. the content di- different way yeah uh, when companies start investing in, in uh, creating the demand basically they they think of advertising right yeah single thing that comes to their mind because yeah. they think actually about closing the demand not creating the demand but uh, like all of them have a list of the companies they want to sell like 50 or 100 of them right mm-hmm. ideal clients yes uh because they usually have sales so if they have sales they have a list mm. so isn't it the easiest way to come to talk to those people directly by uh doing a series of interviews or creating an episode of podcast just like this one and asking them where do they go to get educated how is the decision making process going who is involved uh, do they already have a vendor are they using any tools how do they think about that specific function in a company? Uh, and then using that to create one-on-one relationship with them, involving your ideal customers in, uh, in actually creating and distributing the, con- the content. When you do that, you will also involve other people in the company. So maybe that person doesn't realize that you need that product, but somebody who is actually going to use it, sees, listen to the podcast, and then comes up with, uh, you know, with uh, influencing the decision maker from, from below uh, and coming up with that. Also, with that piece of content, you can chop it up and basically um, influence people in different stages of the buyer's journey. And you do that only with one piece of content, all of that. And uh, so it's pretty amazing what you can do with the content but you just need to think it through and have a strategy behind it. The first thing that we talk about, map out the customer's journey yes. so you know how do they behave and when you can fit in which, uh, which piece of content. Also, I, I like to, what I like to do, not many companies actually have that. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, and it's thinking about the messaging point of view, the purpose and everything and starting not with a problem, but with a, uh, with a big picture. So, and they're asking strategic narrative style. Uh, when you do that, you actually see where do you have the advantage and when do you have the holes that you can fill in with your uh, communication strategy. And then it's pretty easy to, you know, to, to see a high, I need to distribute this piece over here. I need this piece here. What are the pillar content? Because usually people go and, okay, I'm going to just share my thoughts on LinkedIn or whatever. That's good yes. for branding. Yes. But if you don't have uh, a pillar from which you are actually uh, extracting those posts and things, it will dry up because we all have, you know, like, a certain amount of things that we can come up, you know, in a short period of time. But if we have a strategy and we, if we know how we are taking those pieces out of us, out of other different sources, then it's a completely different story. My friend, this has been a B2B masterclass. I hope everyone finds the value and I hope that tech and SaaS companies and managers listen and get in touch with Amanya because this is the way that we need to go. My friend, before I let you leave, where can people find you? What are the best places and what are some of the things that you're up to at uh, Funky Marketing? Yeah, basically, basically anywhere. I mean, anywhere. Is the best, <laughs> in, in anywhere. The best yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love it. I, mean, anywhere. I, I try to be everywhere. But, uh, you know, like LinkedIn is the most obvious place. If they find me on Twitter, it's good if they DM me. Otherwise, if they look at the tweets, I talk about <laughs> basketball, NBA, partisan. Oftentimes, I, I get into the threads and cheering in Serbian. So people yeah. come because of the bit of marketing and say, what the fuck is this guy writing about? Uh, so, because uh, I need one channel to, you know, to let it yeah. all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would. Instagram is is more, you know, like different, but basically funkymarketing.net uh, is the website and they can find everything from the website. But it's interesting that you're saying that because you have to sort of be everywhere and everything for everyone now, but still also be a niche. It's a bit of a contradiction. Um, it, it all depends. Like I'm present everywhere. It doesn't mean that I'm investing in every channel. Ah, I get you. That makes sense. Namanya, thank you so much for joining me today. To our listeners, peace, love, and prosperity. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. <laughs>